you're going to keep your body in shape, and I'm going to make sure that you do. Okay. After all, it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells in you, and I trust that you do, by the grace of God, seek to maintain, regardless of age, uh, at least some form of good health. All right, we're over in Exodus chapter 12, looking at verses 29 through 33. I hope you appreciate what I just read you a moment ago. I tried to put the emphasis and expression into the text that I think was probably felt, and much more so that night that the angel of death began to slaughter. Think of how large the land of Egypt is. Think of how many million people were there. Is there wasn't a house where there wasn't one dead. Can you imagine that in the United States? Think about all the houses that are in the United States. Can you imagine if in one night there was a scream, the parents run upstairs and find their child convulsing and dying, and that is happening in every house in the United States. It's not haphazard. It's their eldest, who is their firstborn child. Maybe a girl. Are you a firstborn child? A lot of you are. Every house, firstborn child. You know, only God would know which animals were firstborn. This was not accidental. This had been foretold. It had been prophesied. It had been warned. Nine plagues before this had been executed by God to break the stubborn, rebellious, hard heart of Pharaoh and his servants and ultimately the people of the land of Egypt because they began to say, well, if that's the way Pharaoh is, that's the way we're going to be too. We see that in our country today. God says, I'm going to kill the animals too. You will know that I am God. I'm God of heaven and earth. I'm the God who made all things. I not only look down and see who the people are, but I know, as Jesus put it, every sparrow that falls. And he didn't just say your father knows it. He says, not a sparrow falls without your father. Not just without your father's knowledge, without your father. Your father is the one who takes the sparrows out one at a time as he will in the order that he will at the location where he will for the purposes that he will even if you and I never know about it God has a sovereign plan in doing it I hope you understand that last verse for we all be dead men they suddenly began to realize their own mortality I think most of us go through life without ever really, I mean really, thinking about our own mortality. The day of our death. So few people even think about it that they don't plan for it. It just happens and then they let somebody else worry about it. There was terror in the land of Egypt that night. The God might strike terror to our hearts when it comes to obedience. Not merely knowing his will, but obeying his will. Dear friends, death is around the corner. He can take you out anytime he wants. He can take a loved one out anytime he wants. Old or young, middle-aged, male or female, married or unmarried God takes us out to teach lessons not merely because our time has come one of the main points of this passage is God takes people out to teach a lesson a lesson of obedience I think that's rather significant now we have a few initial observations before we get into the passage the first thing is God fulfilled his prophetic word precisely, exactly, completely, to the letter and not 
allegorically, symbolically, mythologically, partially, haphazardly, or imprecisely. There are many in the reform camp today who do not believe that God fulfills his word literally, especially about things of judgment and especially about things of the future. But God always fulfills his word completely, exactly, precisely to the letter and not allegorically, symbolically, mythologically, partially, haphazardly, or imprecisely. He always fulfills prophecy precisely. And how he will fill the prophetic future as recorded in Revelation, Daniel, and elsewhere in Scripture, that's exactly how he'll do it there too. And if you read with any attention at all to the details, like in the book of Revelation, you know that some horrifying times are coming on the earth. Now, in the context of that, we can make at least eight foundational observations on the text. At least eight foundational observations on these five verses that I've just read. Number one, sometimes it takes death that is close to you to get your attention and your obedience. Number one, sometimes it takes death that is close to you to get your attention and obedience. Number two, Sometimes it takes the fear of your own death, which is what we see at the end of this passage, to get your attention and your obedience. God just isn't trying to get your attention. He's getting your attention so that he can get your obedience. Number three, sometimes it takes death to realize the sovereignty of God and that you want his blessing and not his curse. Pharaoh sure shows that here after he screams to them, please, please get out of my land and, and, and ask God to bless me. He finally gets the point. Sometimes it takes death to realize the sovereignty of God and that you want his blessing and not his curse. Number four, sometimes you will be driven to panic. Now listen to this next part. At the most inconvenient times, because you didn't obey when you had the opportunity in the good times. <laughs> I think that's a major point in this passage here. Sometimes you will be driven to panic at the most inconvenient times because you didn't obey when you had the opportunity in the good times. It's a serious lesson that we need to learn, folks. When everything seems to be going along fine, we just keep disobeying because we think, after all, everything's okay. And, uh, you know, God will overlook me. And, uh, you know, it's just a little sin. And, after all, I'm doing fine. And, you know, the world around me feels really good the way I'm doing it right now. And I'm just sort of moving with the flow and everything's going like it should be going. Pharaoh and the people of Egypt had good times. Those judgments didn't start out really, really, really bad. They were slightly inconvenient. But hey, blood, frogs, lice, flies, you know, we can live with that. Dear people, we're in good times right now, but we're coming to the end of them. We need to pay attention, let God get our attention, and begin to obey while there is opportunity. Number five. When judgment falls, it will hit your family, it will hit you economically, and it will hit you personally. See, it, by killing the cattle, that really was a major blow to the economy of the land of Egypt. When judgment falls, it will hit your family, it will hit you economically, and it will hit you personally. Sixth lesson that we learn out of that passage. When judgment falls, there will be no place to hide. Did you notice that? It's not just in Pharaoh's household. It's said all the way down to the criminals in prison, firstborn in their houses. God didn't say, well, you know, after all, you know, they're... They're not really important citizens, and they're locked up anyway, and so what's going to happen? God killed their firstborn, too. Judgment falls. It hits the highest to the lowest. There is no respect of persons. That's number seven. And God makes that very clear in the New Testament, too. 
What shall we do? Do it heartily to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Doesn't matter how much you think you're little Miss Goody Two Shoes, there is no respect of persons you receive for the wrong which you have done. You better not do wrong. Number eight. And this goes back to the very first lessons in the Ten Plagues. And we saw it in every lesson of the Ten Plagues. This is one of the things that it is a, a thread that runs through all ten of the plagues. Number eight. When judgments fall, you will not try to cut a deal with God. Pharaoh tried to cut deals all the way up to this point. He bluffed, he bullied, he tried to cut deals, he shenaniganed, he lied. But when this plague hits, you will not try to cut a deal with God. In fact, you will obey in everything required without argumentation. Did you pick that up? He said he called for Moses and Aaron in the night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord, as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. He ended up doing what God wanted him to do in the end anyway. It didn't matter how long he held out. It didn't matter how long he stonewalled. It didn't matter how much he argued or cut deals or how much he tried to bully or bluster. How many times he lied, it didn't matter. In the end, he did what God wanted him to do. And that's the way it is with us too, folks. You can drag your feet all you want. You can procrastinate all you want. You can dilly-dally all you want. You can be stubborn and try to give other uh, avenues of doing what you're supposed to be doing. I have an illustration of that, but I won't give it to you here this morning of something that happened within this past week around here. You know, somebody who wanted to do their own thing rather than doing what the board had asked them to do. You know, you can fiddle around all you want, but in the end, you will do what God wants you to do. And it will be very painful when he finally forces you to do it. And that's what we see going on here in our text. You will obey in everything required without argumentation, so don't wait for the judgment to fall and ravage you with a pound of flesh closest to your heart. Obey now while you've got the chance. Okay, that's sort of an outline of what's happening here in the passage. We'll develop it, the Lord willing, a little more next week. Not today, but next week. But I want to give you the connection so you'll see how it connects with the five weeks that we talked about child training. Because our country is about to radically explode, as I told you, and implode as a result of the last three or four generations of Christians who have focused on their own temporal comfort and wealth so if they didn't pass on, they failed to pass on a truly Christian heritage to their children. We looked at three different areas of failure. They are all inseparably connected. You can't have one without having the other two. And if one of them is weak, the other two will be weak as well. Those three areas are teaching. That's doctrine. We dealt with a lot of that last week. Discipline. That is Christian parents in this country who have followed Dr. Spock instead of following the biblical mandates for corporal punishment. In other words, beating their kids with a rod. And number three, example. By saying to them, do what I say, not what I do. That's hypocrisy. For example, birth control. So they really can't oppose abortion with any moral authority. Drinking and smoking as their right, so they really can't oppose drugs with any moral authority. You see, it merely compounds in the children. We could give lots of illustrations of that, but those are the three areas. Discipline, example, and teaching. And you cannot take away one without making the other two crumble. They are all interconnected. Teaching was the first area of failure, the failure to pass on sound doctrine, in case you didn't get it before. Notice how you cannot disconnect teaching from example and doctrine. Listen to this carefully. What you really believe shows up in your lifestyle, what you do. You know what that is? That's example. So what you believe shows up how you live, and people see that, that's the example. You can't separate those two things. And that shows up in what you excuse as permissible. That's the area of discipline, letting them get away with it. Those three things are inseparably tied together. We looked at a lot of those things in First Timothy, how they're reflected here in modern America. I'm just going to read you this passage. Don't make any more comment on it because we've talked about it. 
But we know this, that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, that's homosexuals, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to what? Sound doctrine. What you believe affects how you live. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. 2 Timothy 4.3 certainly describes America. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Titus 1.9 Hold fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Titus chapter 2, verse 1, But speak thou the things which become, that is, which adorn, sound doctrine. It changes your life, folks, if you really believe it. Now, you can talk theology all day long, and you can theoretically believe all the Reformed doctrines. But if it doesn't change your life, you don't believe it. True doctrine, truly believed, always changes the life. That means that you're going to be setting an example. That means you're going to be standing for things that may end up in discipline for somebody else. Oh, even in your own life. Now, we've been looking at the plague of darkness and the death of the firstborn, the judgmental blindness. We spent a lot of time talking about that. It's coming here on the United States. I think Christians are going to suffer here very soon. As I said last week, it appears that this upcoming election is the last that will open the gate for the lions to eat the Christians in the arena. But I want to add some things to that. The grace of God can still intervene if God's people repent. Anything could happen. We don't know what's going to happen, but you know, we are a very important ingredient in it. What could happen? The leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un Sane, could carry out his recent nuclear threats. As you may have heard, China is right now in the process of moving its consulate out of Philadelphia and overseas. What does that signal to you? In the upcoming elections, the second and third place Republican contenders could join together and surpass the number of electoral votes held by the current first place contender. Did you know that? There are two sets of electoral votes at this point do actually outnumber the first place contender. But you know, folks, it doesn't matter. That's not what matters. What matters is us. You know, God can do anything that he wants, including removing America from the stage of history. So what we need to do is stop worrying and start repenting. Quick summary. We looked at multiple reasons why people don't understand the clear teaching of the word of God. I won't repeat all that material here, but it can be summed up in four things. Number one, a key principle. Two, a key application. Three, a few key verses. And four, a key instructional element. Number one, the key principle that we learned was failure to apply doctrine in holy living always results in judgmental blindness. God will not give you more light until you obey the light that you already have. It's a matter of walking in the light, that is, of obeying every day. The key application that we made was don't think that you know what you are not practicing. Application. Don't think you know what you are not practicing. Key verses that we looked at tell us that people who think that they're okay but who are not doing what they know are hypocrites who will come under the judgment of God, Romans 2, 18 through 24. The key instructional element that we learned was the issue of precise obedience, not haphazard obedience, but precise obedience. If we follow God's instructions with precision, we'll have his blessing. If we're sloppy or disobedient about following his instructions, we'll pay for it. Pharaoh finally learns that lesson in our text today. God didn't change. Pharaoh tried to get him to change, but God didn't change. Pharaoh changed. Now, Pharaoh goes back to it while he chases the children of Israel to the shore of the Red Sea, and we'll see that in a few weeks. And Pharaoh's going to pay for that, too. God is a God of order and precision. He expects his children to follow his example and not be slothful, careless, or sloppy in our obedience to his word. He expects diligence, commitment, faithfulness to his word, regardless of the inconvenience involved. Our obedience is to be perpetual, morning, noon, and night, as long as we live, and is to be everywhere and in all circumstances of life, regardless of where we are at the time. Let me put in a plug for Wednesday evenings. God is not a God 
of situational ethics. Let me say that again. God is not a God of situational ethics. Do what is right and leave the results to God. I think it was Bob Jones uh, Jr., maybe it was Bob Jones Sr., the one who years and years and years ago was an evangelist here in America, but made that statement. I think that's where I picked it up, is either from the senior or from the junior. Do what is right and leave the results to God. Your job is not to determine your results. Your job is obedience. Do what is right and leave the results to God. That applies to the current national election as well. Don't just vote for the lesser of two evils. I had somebody in this church last week come up to me and tell me, well, you know, if, if it's so-and-so against so-and-so, well, I'm going to have to vote for so-and-so, even though I think that they're very, very bad and very, very evil, uh, and, you know, have actually given money to the other side, not once, not twice, but to one of the candidates running against that person, not three times, ten times to their political campaigns. There is no difference. Forget the situational ethics. Don't just vote for the lesser of two evils. Do right and leave the results to God. Pharaoh tried to be a politician instead of a statesman, and he lost big time. We learned the lesson that so-called believing is not enough. The issue is how do you respond by action to the truth that you know in your head? How do you respond by action to the truth that you know in your head? We saw the solution, how to avoid the plague of darkness in the church with four words, walk, reprove, wrestle, and trust. You are sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord? Walk as children of light. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Ephesians 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Colossians 1.13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Four words, walk, reprove, wrestle, trust. The second reason we saw that people don't understand is suppression of the truth. We touched briefly on the third reason people don't understand. They're unsaved. The fourth reason that people don't understand. They're carnal. The fifth reason people don't understand is spiritual atrophy. It's not enough to have known the truth at one time or to have practiced it a long time ago. You must keep practicing it daily to keep strong. The minute you stop growing, you start dying. Never forget that. We applied that to practical family life of the question, what happens to a child who knows the truth, babbles it with his mouth, but does not obey or do it? And we saw the answer to that in Hebrews chapter 10. They come into the chastening hand of the Father. Application. What excuses do you give to God? Not to yourself, not to your family, not to the pastor, not to other people. What excuses do you give to God for missing church or being perpetually late? The text in Exodus 12:26 assumes and states that our children will be internally prompted to ask us as their parents for wisdom and guidance when we ourselves are obeying God. Don't miss that point. When we ourselves are obeying God. That's why we have to obey with precision. Our children are watching us. Our grandchildren are watching us and questioning as they build their framework for life. We've already seen that proper obedience and service, produce, service produces worship. That's the correct response for all doctrinal teaching, biblical discipline, and God-fearing example. Do you understand worship? Have you taught your children and grandchildren what it means to worship God in a way that is pleasing to Him, not merely stimulating to your flesh? Have you taught your children and grandchildren that appropriate worship includes being on time for church and not skipping church for reasons of inconvenience? Have you taught them that being habitually late disrupts worship of others? Have you taught them that missing church for your own convenience teaches them that the worship of God is not a priority? Houston, we have a problem here. Let me give a transition. Child training. Doctrine truly believed always results in a changed life. Have you taught this to your children and grandchildren? The New Testament application of that principle is found in Romans chapter 12. This is all new material. Look at the three specific ways that teaching it, believing it, and obeying it does at least three things in your life. All that stuff we've just studied is illustration of what Paul is teaching in Romans chapter 12. Number one, if you believe it, and obey it, it will do at least three things in your life. Number one, it will transform your life. Metamorphosis is the Greek word that's used there. 
It will metamorphosize your life, turning you from an ugly worm into a beautiful butterfly. Number two, it will instruct your life in the exercise of your spiritual gifts. Romans 12 is one of the major passages dealing with spiritual gifts. It will instruct your life in the exercise of your spiritual gifts to the edifying of the entire church and the gaining of spiritual rewards. Really two prongs under number two. Edifies the church and gets you eternal rewards. And number three, it makes a lasting impact on the surrounding world for the glory of Christ. When you really believe the Word of God and when you obey the Word of God, it will make a lasting impact on the world for the glory of Christ. That's all in Romans chapter 12. We'll be looking at that in just a second. You say, wow, that's really great. I want that. Okay. There are some requirements. This is not a freebie. There are some requirements if you want those three things. The transformation of your life, instructing your life in the exercise of spiritual gifts, edifying the church, gaining spiritual rewards, and making a lasting impact on the surrounding world around you. There are some requirements. Look carefully at what is required of you. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If you don't start there, with Romans 12, 1. If you don't start there with a once and for all, all time giving, that's an aorist tense. We've talked about that in the past. How it's punctiliar action, how it means that you make a decision that affects not just right now, but all the rest of your life. Continuing results that go all the rest of the way through your life, like throwing a rock into the middle of the pond. And there ripples, it 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 ripples farther and farther and farther and farther out. If you don't start here giving your body to God as a living, holy, and acceptable sacrifice, you will never grow from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. Say, so, yeah, I've heard you say that before. Okay, let me put it in practical terms. You don't understand it. In practical terms. That means you give your body to Him in all the things that you use for excuses for not doing His will. What are the excuses that you've used to tell God that's why I can't do your will? Remember Moses tried that tact too? Moses, go to talk to Pharaoh. But, but, but I can't, 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 Moses, you idiot. Who made your mouth? If I tell you to do something, I will give you the power to do it, says God. You have, neither do I, you have no excuses. None. That means you give your body to him in all your weakness. You give your body to him in all your sickness. You give your body to him in all your problems. You give your body to him in all your poverty. You give your body to him in all your age. You give your body to him in all your ugliness, in all your incapacity, in all your inability, in all your disease, in all your damage, in all your excuse making, in all your stubbornness, in all your carnality, in all your covetous idolatry, in all your gluttonous flab, in all your disorganized uncleanness, with all your pimples, warts, wrinkled skin, baggy eyelids, and B.O. He wants you and takes you as you are. It's not your job to clean yourself up first. If you wait for that, you'll never come to him at all. God wants you now, as you are. Make the presentation of Romans chapter 12. We all say those things to the people who are unsaved and lost and headed for hell. God says that to us too. When we come, it's not a bed of ease and roses and flowers. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the price and sailed through bloody seas? He wants you now as you are. Don't use your weakness, your sickness, your pimples, and your B.O. as an excuse for not obeying him now. It's his job to do the cleanup and the makeover. Most Christians never make this once and for all presentation of their bodies. They pretend to do it. But in reality, they still sit on the throne of their own lives. They still want to be in control of their own lives <laughs> and everybody else around them, too. They manipulate. They still want to be in control. But you know something? That's fairly stupid. 
Do you want to remain a baby who has to be spanked over and over again for the same perpetual carnal stupidity? Remember, this message, we're talking about dead meat everywhere. I haven't lost my train of thought, haven't got off the subject. You see, dead meat everywhere includes dead meat in the church. Dead meat in the church. When there's enough dead meat in the church, the church dies. Dr. Carl McIntyre, the founder of this church, wrote a book. I've got a copy of it right here. The Death of a Church. About the liberalism that had crept into the PCUS and the PCUSA, what it is now, and into other denominations. You can get a free copy off the display table in the church narthex if you want a copy of that. I suspect most of you haven't read it. But you know something? Churches don't just die for liberalism. They can be solid Bible-believing churches like the church at Ephesus, the very first church that Jesus talked to in the book of Revelation, who had lost their first love. Jesus said he would kill their church if they didn't repent. Remember, churches also die for stubbornly insisting on their own personal pleasure, wealth, and prosperity, like Laodicea. Like with leprosy, when you have enough dead meat, the body finally dies. It starts with the skin rotting and falling off. Then body parts begin to rot and fall off while the body keeps struggling to survive. Finally, the whole body dies because every part failed to do what it was supposed to do. Every part is important. That's the point of Romans 12. In Romans 12, Paul has just been discussing bodies and sacrifice. That's dead meat, folks. Look at verse 2 and following. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, as one person has put it, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Develop the mind of Christ. Learn to think biblically. 1 Corinthians 2.16 Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. The Christian starts with an entirely different set of premises, which is why there is such thing as a distinctly Christian worldview. Again, I put in a plug for Wednesday evening. Join us on Wednesday when we're talking about biblical ethics, why the world always reaches the wrong conclusions and why they can't find a foundation for their conscience knowing to be what their conscience already knows to be, right and wrong and true and morally acceptable and morally wrong. Verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me, we're back to Romans 12 now, to every man that is among you not to think of himself, did you get the word think? Listen, three times in one verse. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Here we are again, back to the Christian mind, learning to think like a Christian meanings, viewing the world soberly, seriousness of mind and purpose, not like a drunk who doesn't care and can't control his mind, emotions, will, or body. Last Wednesday in prayer meeting, where we're studying the Christian ethics, <clears throat> encourage you to come Wednesday evening. It will make you think. It's hard material, what we're doing on Wednesday evening. You think I'm hard. You should hear these guys who are debating these issues at Princeton University. I mentioned a book I read in college last Wednesday. Um, that was when I was in college, was shortly before the flood of noise, you know, uh, called The Christian Mind by Harry Blamires. Reading that and the works of Francis Schaeffer brought into focus what I have tried to sharpen and practice ever since. Learning to think like a Christian, not like the pagans in the world around us. When you actually think, then everything is under the control of the central controlling organ in your body, the brain. And so Paul has just talked about that here, the thinking part. And so after talking about that organ, Paul goes on to the rest of the chapter to discover, discuss various members of the body. Eyes, ears, nose, mouth, hands, feet. You know, Paul is on the same kind of a theme here. There's a body that's going to live or there's a body that's going to die. Notice, also, every believer has a measure of faith, it says, that's going to result in God-glorifying works. In other words, the measure of faith is like the bloodstream that goes coursing through our body, bringing life-giving nutrients to every part so that each part can do the work that it was designed to do. When you got leprosy, eventually your fingers begin to fall off. 
You can't do certain things. Have any of you ever done any study on leprosy? It's incredibly horrendous. Hansen's disease. The body finally dies, but not before it goes through incredible incapacity and suffering and filthy stench, the stench of leprosy. James talks about that, that measure of faith given to every believer. Wilt thou know, O man, that faith without works is dead? The bloodstream carries the nutrients to the members of the body so that the body can work. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? By works was his faith made perfect. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Dead bodies. Dead meat everywhere. You get it? Three times in three verses. Dead meat everywhere in the church. Hang on, we haven't lost our train of thought. Back to Romans. Romans 12, verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, we got bodies here, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Did you get that? If you didn't, back when I was preaching on the spiritual gifts, listen to it now. Nobody else in the church, in this church, nobody else in this church, has exactly the same spiritual gifts and combination of gifts that you have. Nobody else. You have a unique set of spiritual gifts, not talents, not human talents, we're not talking that, we're talking spiritual gifts that nobody else has. Now remember that in the context of what we're doing back in Exodus, we're talking about the plague of death, we're talking about dead meat everywhere, do you understand the application? How it fits with what I'm trying to say out of Romans 12, listen carefully. I'm applying it now to you and to me. God placed you into this church because you are essential to the very spiritual survival of this church. When you fail to function properly, you are murdering this church. When you fail to properly fit into and give your full, unwavering, fully committed service to this church, you are strangling this church and making other Christians here suffer for your own personal, selfish, and carnal reasons. Paul's talking about that in Romans 12. Churches die, people, as well as individuals, as well as nations. Remember what Paul said, you're not a member to yourself. It says you are, quote, every one members one of another. If you're not a member, if you're a member here, do you attend all the services? Why not? If you're a member, do you give sacrificially, not just the bare minimum of the tithe? A tithe is bare minimum, folks. That was required under the law. We're under grace. Certainly, what we've received under grace is worth more than 10%. If you're a member, oh, let me poke here for a minute. Do you attend the annual congregational meeting, which is coming up? in one month. That's one evening out of 365 evenings in the year. One. One third of one percent. Less than one third of one percent of your evenings. Or do you irresponsibly shrug your shoulders with the careless attitude of, well, somebody else can do that because it's boring? How often do you really pray for this church? I mean, like, really wrestle in prayer for any extended time. How often do you fast for this church? <laughs> Better question is, have you ever fasted in your life for spiritual reasons, not just because you're on a diet trying to lose weight? Dear people, you are part of a body. You're part of a body that currently is alive. But it can be a body that dies, dead meat everywhere. All through church history, dead meat everywhere. You're part of a body. You are not on your own. God put you here to minister. 
not just to soak it up, not just to feel good, not just to complain when things aren't going your way. Here at Bible Presbyterian Church, do we want to see dead meat everywhere? I hope not. I don't. Our time is up. I was going to read you the rest of the passage, but what I'll do is I'll just give you the seven things that are in this passage. You know, I can't comment on all of it today. We'll take that next week, the Lord willing. Uh, ask yourself, when you read that passage, how does it apply to me? I've spent six months covering all the spiritual gifts listed in that chapter, but there are at least seven other lists in Romans chapter 12. Number one, all the spiritual motivations. Number two, all the spiritual attitudes. Number three, spiritual actions. Number four, spiritual results to be expected when functioning correctly. Number five, spiritual responses pleasing to God. Six, spiritual deference. Number seven, spiritual application to the real world around us in which we live. There's a lot in that passage. Study it sometime. Don't just skate across it mindlessly in your quest to read through the Bible in a year. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your word and for its power. It applies to us. It's not just merely a bunch of interesting history about Jews 3,400 years ago. These things are written for our edification, for our exhortation, upon whom the ends of the world are come, that we might not fall into the same sins that they fell into. These things have application to the church. We are not Israel, but we learn much about you, the living God, and how you dealt with Israel and how you deal with churches and nations and individuals. Help us, Father, to believe and to obey with precision. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before...